Welcome to the Mo Show Live, everybody. Hey, I'm Morris Lilienthal. You know, we're also thankful for our first responders and, and all the, 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 the police and firemen and paramedics and, and others are doing, especially during the, this COVID outbreak that we, we're hearing, uh, you know, about how they're stepping up and in and, and, and this time of need and doing things. I think uh, one group of first responders that I, I really believe sometimes gets lost in the mix and that, that we really need to be appreciative of and support more are our volunteer fire departments. And I'm really excited to be talking with one of our local volunteer fire departments and one of our local uh, leaders here who has stepped up and answered the call to serve his community and talk about his department and really the role that volunteer fire departments play across the country to give us more perspective on that and how we can support them and, and do. And so our guest today is Blake Mathis. Blake is a captain with the Monrovia uh, Volunteer Fire and Rescue Department here in Madison County, Alabama. Uh, let me do a quick little introduction uh, of Blake and then we'll kind of get started and dive right into everything. Uh, Blake was raised uh, in North Alabama in Florence. Um, he's kind of got it in his blood, as I understand from talking to Blake before the show, that, that his dad was a, was a firefighter, a career firefighter for over 26 years. And so I think he's got a little bit of that in his blood, and that's probably part of why he's, he's felt called to, to, to do volunteer firefighting. Um, he has been a volunteer firefighter, I think, for nine to 10 years now with the Monrovia Department. And when he's not answering calls and, and coming to those in need, he uh, serves uh, and works for Air Evac, the largest air medical service uh, provider in the country. Blake, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule today. How are you doing? Good, good. And uh, if my dad were watching, I had 10 years of that. It's 36 years he was there. So uh, 36 years. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thank, him. <laughs> Thank him for his service and do. And like I said, I, I know that that is a uh, you know, a, a passion. And I, I, I'm sure, you know, you've got fond memories of growing up and going to the fire station and riding on the fire truck and, and getting to blow that horn and riding and doing. So I, I think you probably lived every little boy's dream uh, about yeah. the fire engine at some point when you were growing up. Um, folks, if you're, if you're watching today and you're watching the live recording, let us know. I'm going to be monitoring uh, Facebook feed over here and we're glad to, 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 to say hello to us. If you've got questions about the Monrovia department, or you've got questions about volunteer firefighters or have a comment or how somebody in the volunteer fire department has impacted you, please leave a comment. If you're doing uh, what a lot of people do, which is catching the show on a replay, or if you're listening to the podcast, jump on over here and in the Facebook comments and we'll monitor those and try to get you an answer to your question or any resource that you may have a question about. Um, so I guess, you know, maybe start with a little bit about your department of like, can you kind of tell our viewers a little bit about maybe the the size of your department and, and the number of volunteers that work with the department. So we kind of have some understanding of, of what your community and department looks like. So those who may not be familiar with the, the community of Monrovia, we're just north of Madison city limits, um, just north of Highway 72 there in Madison. And then we go up to around Nick Davis Road. If you're a local person, you, you'll know where that is. We have approximately about a five square mile area. And uh, you know, our population that we cover as volunteers runs around 35,000 citizens. So it's, it's quite a, a populated area and dense. It's very dense. So in a five square mile area, approximately uh, about 15,000 homes, about 35,000 residents, give or take. And so we, like most departments, depend on local volunteers uh, that want to serve their community that want to learn and tr get trained. Uh, there's a lot of training involved, which we'll probably talk about that in a bit. Uh, but we, at any given time, we like to have around at least 20 or 30 active volunteers. It's in the in the recent years, uh, and I say recent, uh, even my, my dad retired in 11, but even before then, a lot of fire departments started running medical calls with their local first responders on the, you know, ambulance crews, the, the paramedics and the EMTs. So the fire departments got into the medical response business years ago. We're still in it now. So our department depends on not only firefighters, but also certified EMTs at the state level and national level to wake up, you know, whatever time of night it is, as well as throughout the day to respond in our area with HIMSI, uh, which is all of Madison County, when there's an emergency response. So we like to have the more the merrier, as long as people are going to try to do their part and, and volunteer. But I'd say at any given time, we have about 30 uh, active members. Uh, we have uh, some people who are newer, so it takes them a little while to get trained and get going. Uh, we have families and uh, things change with our, our volunteers. They have kids or get married 
and sometimes they that they need to slack off a little bit. We don't want people to get burned out and not want to help. So it's a wide range of people that help make it happen out of those 20 or 30 people. Um, some departments, including ours, we've had as many as, you know, 50 or so active people, 60 people in, in the past. Uh, Huntsville area being a military and government town, uh, people come and go, contracts come and go, military comes and go. Uh, people that live in our boundaries are members that grow up, get married, move out of district. That, that happens. So we're, it's a, all departments are a constant. Um, we're constantly seeking new people to want to wanna volunteer in their community. So that's kind of a little bit about as far as numbers wise, how many how many we have and kind of the basics of our calls. Some, something that struck me doing a little research and, and you and I talked about this and I, and I did a little digging after we had our, our kind of meeting a couple of days ago to talk about today's interview was according to the National Fire Protection Association, 85% of the nation's fire departments are all or mostly volunteer. You know, and, and I guess that should have occurred to me growing up in rural Alabama and the Pickens County, Alabama, where I grew up, we don't have a, you know, it's all volunteer, the whole county. And where I live now in East Limestone is volunteer. So I guess, you know, but I just take it for granted. I think Huntsville or Madison and where you live in Birmingham or Nashville or Atlanta or somewhere like that. But when you think that 85% of the, the country is, is served by volunteer fire departments, that's a whole lot. I mean, it means we're really relying on people like you to step up and answer the call. It is a drastic number that people aren't used to. Uh, but if you stop and think about it, for example, let's take our local area, Madison County. So in the city of Madison, or in the county of Madison, there are two city entities, Huntsville and Madison City. But once you get outside of those city limits, it's volunteer departments. And footprint wise, those two cities are quite small when it comes to the geographical makeup of the county. Um, right. So there's two paid departments. Each of those have multiple stations. I believe Madison has three and um, Huntsville has 12 or 15, give or take, to cover their citizens. But outside the city, city limits, there's 16 additional volunteer fire departments, uh, departments, not just uh, stations, but departments that cover the rest of the Madison County with a population of about 380,000, give or take. Uh, take out the Huntsville City and the Madison City, the rest of those are covered by 16 departments that are that use volunteers to respond to medical and fire calls uh, throughout, throughout the year. And going back to what you said, um, the last research I did was there was about, it was about 1.1 million firefighters in, this, in the country and about 725,000 of those are volunteers. So it's a, as far as people who volunteer, who become firefighters, uh, obviously the overwhelming majority are volunteers that cover the, the country uh, and, and the, the rural areas. And even Monrovia, you know, at one time it was a lot of farmland. There are a lot of homes here now. It's, I wouldn't call it rural because we butt up to Madison City, one of the fastest growing cities in Alabama but it doesn't have a paid fire department or a police department other, other than the sheriff's department. It's not a city entity, I should say, a municipality. So uh, you're right. A lot of people would, are, are surprised when they hear how many volunteers there are. Yeah, and there's more volunteer fire departments in our county than there are uh, paid departments. And, Absolutely. And um, I guess you kind of touched on this, but to kind of give some perspective to our viewers, you guys are not just responding to, to somebody's house on fire. I mean, if there's a, a house, a fire call, I guess if there's if there's a car wreck out in the community or if there's a medical call, I mean, you guys are getting called out just like the normal fire department or maybe even the police may be getting called out in the county somewhere, right? Absolutely. So the, the currently the, the bulk of our calls are medical calls. So anytime, and we'll just use Monrovia, uh, but this could apply to Harvest or Meridianville or Central, anywhere. But if someone picks up the phone and dials 911 and they're in the county, uh, that the county 911 call taker immediately finds out if it's a fire or a car wreck or a medical call. And they start taking information and let, in our case, our county fire dispatch know. And then they dispatch, dispatch us out, the, the, the correct department that is. And so the majority of our calls currently are medical calls. Uh, Monrovia ran, I think, right at 2,000 calls last year in 2019, and about 70, 75 percent are medical calls. So whether it be, you know, someone's having chest pains or shortness of breath or um, a heart attack or, um, you know, a finger that was caught in the weed whacker or whatever, if, if 911's called and it's a medical call in our area, 
we're going to respond with our local ambulance, which is handy, of course, in Madison County. So we're going with them. And uh, that, that's a lot of calls. Yeah. And so, I mean, you think 2000 calls, I mean, what is the, you know, I know one of the things that I think you guys probably pride yourself on and, and certainly just from a, a life-saving perspective is response time. So how are you, how does that come in from a logistical standpoint, you know, you know, with, you know, Huntsville or Madison or Nashville or whoever, when they call the main fire, you know, there's a fire department or dispatch within the fire station, I'm assuming 911 dispatches that certain local unit. How does that work with you guys? Uh, you know, let's say E911 calls in and, and it's someone within y'all's dispatch, do they, is it dispatched to a certain person? And then how is it determined who makes, who responds to that call from y'all's department? How does that work? So what's unique about volunteer fire departments is you have to have a makeup of people from all backgrounds and time availabilities and things like that. So people aren't always available. Uh, we have members who work on the arsenal. Uh, we have people that work at a restaurant. We have people that uh, work at pharmacies and they're not always available. So the idea is different people are available at different times. Specifically to answer the question about the call is, in our, in our county, every, every county is a little different. Some uh, still use beepers and pagers, and uh, we have two-way radios from other roads that are really reliable. So we get alerted uh, by our radios um, that there's a call in our district. Every, every radio is set off. Now, if, you're, if it's a medical call, only the medical responders are set off. If it's uh, any other call, then everybody's radio is set off, whether it's two in the afternoon or two in the morning. And then based on being able to talk to a communication, we have some advances also in apps that we use uh, luckily on the smartphones that we can actually pull up the app because it alerts us as well <clears throat> with the uh, radios. The, uh, they go hand in hand and uh, the information is displayed on our phones. We can press a button that lets other responders know that, hey, I'm in route, I'm going. So quickly the officers, our senior leaders can see how many people are responding to that call. And there are times where we will say pages again for additional resources, if it's a fire or something like that. Um, and then that's what happens when, when the call comes out as far as who's available. It basically depends on who's available. So we ask people when they join, when you're available and once you're trained, respond when you can. Don't respond to everything because you'll wear yourself out. Uh, it'll become you know addictive. If you're trying to respond to every call, you can't do that 2000 calls a year right so the whole thing is is we respond with who's available uh, some right. employers are not nice enough to let their people leave work during that time that's always been the case across the country some employers are more understanding uh, a lot of departments when they first started and even today um, whether they're if they're way in rural areas they may be farmers or farm hands but they're trained and when they when a neighbor is in need they drop what they're doing and go uh, I've known of some businesses that will let their employees leave in a serious situation when they're short on proof and they'll let them leave work. And that's not normal, uh, but some will do that. And that's how we get the calls answered is based on who's available. But everybody gets the call and whoever's available goes. The good part about our county is we have a redundant system that we back up each other. So our closest sister station is Harvest Fire Department, as well as on the other side is um, Madison City. So we share territories actually with Huntsville as well. Monrovia is a little unique. We, we border Huntsville City, Madison City, and Harvest. And depending on where the call is geographically, if it's a serious call, like a working structure fire, as we call it, automatically Harvest will come with us. Or if it's on the south side, Madison City will come with us, uh, be dispatched with us. And in the daytime, for example, if we had a very limited coverage of personnel, we would ask them to come if they aren't already. So that's how we get it covered just in case. That's amazing. And, and, and I think I was talking with you or someone else with your department that was telling me that uh, it was just, I forgot the number, Blake, but the, the response time that you guys are there in just a matter of a few minutes. And to think that you're able to, to leave wherever you're your home or your job and do and get out to, to, to this person in need in, in a short response time is without question saving lives. Yeah, uh, the good thing about most departments is we have uh, quick response vehicles or medical vehicles, uh, just like they look like police cars, but they're fire painted, just like most fire departments have them too, but uh, a SUV of some type. And so we have a rotation where we take turns taking those vehicles to our home. Uh, so all the EMTs, for example, take turns taking the vehicle for a week 
they're asked to run it when they're available. If they're at work, they can't. But uh, we have a lot of people who work night shifts, so they're available to, during the day, et cetera. Our college students who are certified, if, if they get a vehicle, they take it while they're out of class, for example. Or this summer, they were all home. So we have, uh, luckily, a lot of college students who are, are trained for various different responses. And the good part is on that, for especially for medical calls, which currently is the bulk, those responding responder vehicles are out in the community already, not just at one station or two stations and have to go get it and then respond. So if I have the, a medical vehicle that week and there's a call in my neighborhood, I'm there in 30 seconds. Uh, so that's a great way to look at the response. And we all, all departments try to pride themselves on quick responses because we have the personnel planted around the community and we also respond in our personal vehicles. That, that's, a, that's very important to understand that uh, just because you don't have a marked vehicle is no reason to think you can't respond. Most people think that only, they don't, most people don't see volunteers respond in their personal vehicle until they pull up on scene. But they don't realize we're waiting in traffic in a red light like everybody else. And there's an emergency, you know, a half a mile away. But we, of course, can't run red lights and don't, and we can't speed. We have to drive just like everyone else. But we might be the closest person to someone having a heart attack or a baby that's drowning in a pool. Uh, and, and that's one reason we do put our response vehicles around the area so they can, with lights and sirens, safely maneuver through traffic, just like, you know, any other emergency vehicle. Yeah. Folks, if you're just tuning in, in this Moser Live, we're speaking with Blake Mathis. He is a captain with the Monrovia Fire and Rescue uh, Volunteer Department here in Madison County, talking a little bit about the, his department specifically and talking about the role of volunteer fire departments in our in our country and that they respond to a lot of the calls out there and, and, and account for 85% of the uh, fire departments in our country, which is just a truly amazing statistic. Um, you know, when people, you know, step up to answer the call in their community to join their volunteer fire department. And, and I know you're not talking for everybody, but specifically with your department, so our guests can have an idea. I mean, if I wanted to volunteer, you know, out in East Limestone where I live, for example, or if I lived in Renovi, do I need any particular background to come in or other just a, just an open heart and, 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 and you guys will put me in a role that'll fit and provide the training for me? How does that work? That's a great question. Uh, people think it's just certain people who can volunteer. It, it's not. Uh, you don't have to be a firefighter, for example to volunteer at the fire department. Uh, we have medical personnel that just want to do medical. Usually we, usually we taught them to do them both because uh, we cross train them and they usually have an interest. Uh, we do have support members in our department. Uh, most departments do, but we have support members that, don't, that do not do medical or fire. And they may help with fundraisers, uh, community events, uh, setting up events when we go to schools uh, to do fire, um, fire prevention week. Things like that. Uh, Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts want to come tour the department and they'll set up events like that. But that way they're able to help the department without being trained as an EMT or a certified firefighter through the Alabama Fire College, that type of thing. Uh, they also own like a, a long term event when we're at a fire or a, a wreck. We're going to be there for several hours for some reason if it's a serious being investigated and there's fire hazards. The support personnel will bring us water and things like that because it does get very hot out there. But to answer your question, no, there's not a certain background required. You don't have to have experience in firefighting. We do a lot of hands-on training uh, and, and expect that of people who want to have a role of EMS. Now, in our area specifically, uh, just for example, we have eight members uh, of our department that are going to the uh, Calhoun Community College this summer that actually just completed the EMT basic course. So uh, that's, a, that's a large number, we've never had that many, but we had eight members who were non-EMT that have gone through the course this summer to, to help us. Um, we're very excited about that because they're, again, I said the, mul the bulk of our calls are EMS, uh, and so we, we need more EMTs. So you do not have to be an EMT to join a department. You don't have to be a firefighter or certified though the department will teach you what you need to know as long as you have an open heart and want to serve the community. Yeah. Well, that's, that's fantastic. And so you kind of le left a great opening for my next kind of thought or question that I think, which is funding and how, how traditionally, at least here locally, how are all local volunteer fire departments funded? Where do you, where are you getting grants? Are you getting donations? Are you doing fundraising all the above? Can I tell us a little bit about that? 
Yeah, it's kind of all of the above, to be honest with you. Uh, I think the first tier would be from the, the county commission. So we have a, a Madison County Commission. They have uh, representatives for several districts. I believe it's five or six. And of course, they look at all 16 departments, I guess, based on the number of calls and what's needed in the area. And they determine that that's that's above us. But the, 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 the county commission ultimately gives funding to the county responders or each department that they use that budget throughout the year. However, most departments, including us, uh, we do fundraisers throughout the year, uh, uh, various things. Uh, in our area, for years, we've done a, a photo fund drive, a fund drive where we do family portraits a lot. And this is very pretty popular among, among other departments as well. But we'll send people out that represent us to ask for a small donation. And in re return, they get like a family for a portrait and they can buy photographs and things like that. It's worked very well for years. Um, we do, uh, grants are very important. Most people think uh, you just get your funding and that's it. No, if you, if you know how to write grants, there are a lot of departments, uh, a lot of organizations and businesses that will give money, uh, whether it be for air packs that we wear in fires, uh, turnouts. Uh, I've seen people that, that make up their own request to a local entity, a local business that may be in their district or outside their district. It doesn't matter if they've got funds they want to donate write a request for the proposal of what you need, what you want to use it for, you know, how many responses you have, how big is your area you serve, uh, things like that. So grants is a, is a large one. Um, a lot of departments receive sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars in grants for equipment, uh, maybe apparatus or lots of air packs we wear, uh, thermal imagers, which is a device we take in fires so we can see through smoke. All those things are critical to life survival. So. Uh, and then lastly, uh, local donations. Uh, we have a lot of people uh, that just like what we do. It may be a $10 donation. It may be a $500 donation, but people will stop by occasionally or we will have serviced their family as far as uh, responded and helped without a fire or a medical call. And they're like, you know what? We really appreciate you guys. And uh, they'll make a small donation. And, and throughout the year, most departments get little small donations that, that, that add up. They can be used of course for equipment and, and training sometimes training costs money too uh but uh the the apparatus which we have to you know stay up on the hoses that have to be replaced the list goes on and on and on people wouldn't believe the the cost involved but luckily you know we're able to maintain that and and, and get more donations and grants when, when we need to as best we can yeah well that's something i was just thinking you know uh, you know you guys may have a smaller scale department than say they are large cities a department but the equipment needed is in a lot of respects is the same. I mean, if you're fighting a, a house fire in, in, in Monrovia, the house doesn't know whether it's in the city limits of Huntsville or out in the county and the equipment needed to fight that fire would be the same in the general sense. And, and you know, I, I hadn't run a budget for a fire department, but I've got to think those uh, fire engines and all the equipment's pretty expensive. So I would think to, to, to purchase the needed and maintain and keep up and do, that's going to be a, a lot of, a lot of funds that need to be done to, to have a department that has the resources you need to, to take care of the people in your district. Yeah, and the, some of the stats you referred to earlier from the NFPA, National Fire Protection Agency. And so uh, they even, you're, you're probably familiar with the ISO ratings. So ISO ratings, uh, as far as your homeowner's insurance determines kind of how much your homeowner's insurance is based on how safe your area is. Uh, Monroe has a, a, a great score, uh, Madison City, Huntsville. Uh, we all work on trying to get that score lower uh, based on what we have, those apparatuses, the number of personnel, the training hours, all that adds into your ISO rating. I guess it would be called all the scores or a rating. But those those apparatus, like you said, you know, they're going anywhere from seven hundred to seven hundred thousand to a million dollars for a new one. Um, and more importantly, the FPA I mentioned, they require for ISO lower ratings or better ratings, they require uh, annual hose testing. So every one of our hoses has to be stretched out and tested by a certified testing agency. And they don't do that for free. Uh, our air packs have to be tested, every one of them. We may have 40 of them. Uh, they have to be, you know, tanks on them. All the hoses have to be certified and checked because part of the ISO rating is making sure your personnel are safe as well. They don't do that for free. Uh, mm -hmm. Our apparatus maintenance, the, the tires, the oil changes, the pump, uh, pump checkoffs, the pumps have to be checked every year. It never stops. And so all those things have to be done by certified people if you want to keep your ISO, your, hey, keep your people safe, uh, keep your equipment up as best you can, and then maintain low, uh, good ISO ratings for your citizens so they won't have to pay for it 
on their homeowner's insurance helping. Yeah. I think it's something that, that, that I really wonder and, and, and do, and, and I, we hear a lot about what's going on in the community now, but I'm curious, how has the current pandemic impacted your department in terms of either funding or responding to calls? Are you having to take new safety precautions and how you address the public when you're responding? And does it depend upon the type of call you're responding to? You know, I know, it, you know, I, I do, I'm a lawyer and, and, and I handle a lot of accident cases and, and I've seen stuff and I see a lot of times some of the paramedics and stuff where they're responding, they, they're, they're wearing masks and certain things that they may not have been wearing before the pandemic. How is this impacting your department? Absolutely. So every medical call, especially uh, actually now any call because of the, the order that's in place, we always wear masks. Um, it was interesting for about a month and a half when Corona first came out, our call drop, our call volume dropped, including Hemsies as well. The 911 calls dropped. I think people were real nervous about having other people in their home, even though they were hurt or sick. Uh, they tucked it out or just drove themselves to the hospital or whatever, but our calls went down fairly significantly. And then about two months into it, they started coming back up. Uh, so that's when we started, you know, responding to more calls. We always wear the mask. Uh, our dispatch operation now, they ask the questions of the people. Are there any Corona positive patients? Are there any flu-like symptoms, whether it be fever, so on and so forth, coughing, so that we're getting all that data before we arrive. If it's a confirmed case of someone who's had corona, uh, we stage currently until Hensie gets there. Uh, they do have full PPE head to toe that they can put on. Okay. We have it as well. Uh, it, it can be costly. So depending on the type of call, if it's a non-life-threatening situation, we'll wait till Hensie gets there. And if they need us to come in, we will. Uh, if it's a, a full, what we call a full arrest or a heart issue or you know someone can't breathe, then we will suit up in our head to toe and then, of course, throw that away and replace it later. And yeah, there is cost involved in all that. Uh, we had some citizens actually early on who donated extra N95 masks, the, the masks you would want to wear in that situation. Uh, they were virtually impossible to get. And several departments that we noticed were asking for donations. And sure enough, uh, we didn't really have to ask. Uh, people heard about it and they just called us up to them. Are you guys accepting N95 mask donations? And when we, where we get, you know, 40, 50 or 60, not, not thousands, but, you know, a good several dozen uh, that they got us going until they came back in stock. But yeah, those things do cost money. Uh, we, we try to order and keep up with that best we can. And of course, if someone needs us, we're going to suit up our full PPE on the EMS side and, you, and go in. But luckily, uh, Hemsey has all that available. And if they, you know, need us on a situation where it's not, not a severe emergency, they'll let us know and, and we'll come in if need be. So. It is different than our normal business uh, actions, but we're, we're doing we're doing what we need to do. Yeah. Well, and, and, and in that vein, I assume most of the time you guys are first on scene. I mean, before often before the local sheriff's department or state troopers may have evolved if it's the car wreck or before even Hindi gets there. I mean, often somebody from you know larger fire department's first on the scene, so they're the ones doing the initial crisis uh, intervention and management and, and, and alerting other first responders that may be coming to assist as to what's going on there. Yeah, and we, we limit our exposure. So if we're there first or two or three of our responders are there first, we'll approach the door with masks on and ask the people, you know, first of all, get a good understanding of what the emergency is. Is it life-threatening at the moment? Because if someone, you know, twisted their ankle in the house or they fell, it's not life-threatening at the moment. You know, are they talking, are they breathing? Are there any types of flu symptoms or things like that? No. Then we, of course, will proceed with our mask on um, and, and, and go ahead and start care. If it's a, if it's a, if they're getting us in a non-life-threatening situation and they do have flu-like symptoms and things like that, as long as the person's stable, the EMT has a decision, you know, they have the ability to make the decision. We're going to wait right here until the ambulance crew gets here. We just know where they are. And so the paramedics and the EMTs show up with HMSI, uh based on their life safety. Everything's stable then we'll, we'll stage and wait with them and talk with them through the door or, or with the patient, you know, remotely. If they're around the room, we'll talk to someone who's in the home. Uh, now, if they're not stable, it's a different story. We're going we're to suit up and take care of business. But because of the cost of the mask and if it's a non-life-threatening non situation, we are very limited to who we send in. We, we just send one person where normally we'd all go in three or four people. We, we limit that exposure and limit the cost as far as the, the PPE unless we need to go in. Sure. Well, that, that makes, I mean, it, it, 
sometimes I think we forget common sense, but that makes good common sense to me. Um, you know, I guess as we wrap up here again, thank you so much for your time today and, and for your service. Talk to us a minute about how can people either here locally or people that may be watching the show somewhere outside of, of, of North Alabama, how can we support our local volunteer fire department? Either is, it, is it, you know, certainly I'm sure you guys if you are looking for volunteers, but are there other ways from donations or sharing your message or following you guys on most of the departments now? I think you guys have social media and, and supporting you in various ways. Talk to us a little bit about how our mm -hmm. viewers can sure. support your department specifically for local or the department that may serve their area. Sure. So like in our department, we get, we get a lot of requests and a lot of inquiries, I should say. And for example, our, our department has a website, uh, monroeviafire.org. Um, we're also on Facebook, which most departments are. So that's a great place to start is Facebook because the pages are free and most departments make those. Uh, most have a .com as well, but we have a .com and you can submit our inquiry through there. We do have a phone in our department, but uh, you know we're not there 24 hours a day, so we don't always you know, answer the phone because we're not there, but we do answer our emails and Facebook because it comes to several of us and we distribute that out. So people, you know, I, I highly encourage people to support their local volunteer fire department, whether it be joining, uh, whether it be you know, making a contribution occasionally, uh, you know, whatever you want to do to support that, uh, whether it be just encouraging other people you might know, did you know the department? We're, we're a, some people don't know they're in a volunteer fire department area until 911's called. It's really amazing. We'll show up people like, I didn't know you guys were volunteers. Um, right. they, they buy a home in an area and just don't know. But uh, volunteering uh, as an EMS or fire or support member, um, donating money if they would like. Um, we have various events throughout the year that we do departments do. We had a blood drive recently. Just having people promote that on their Facebook page gets more people out to help us uh, donate blood. Uh, so just supporting your local department, there can be a, a variety of ways to do that, but first find out who it is. And uh, if you if you don't know who your local one is, uh, you, you know, depending on the community you live in, you can, you can usually Google it and just type in fire department on Google and your local, wherever you're located, and it would show you the local, the closest fire department. Uh, in our case, it would show Monrovia station one or two. But I'll tell you what, if you can't find that, just contact us. We'll, we'll point you to the right direction, uh, monroeviafire.org. I think that'd be the easiest way. Uh, if you can't find it on Google, which usually it's pretty easily, uh, and in Madison County, we'll, we'll point you to your local department to support them. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do, folks. Um, you know, following the show here, we will, um, you know, Blake, what I'll do is after we get done here in a few minutes, I'll go down in the comments below the video here, and I'll put a link to y'all's website and we'll tag the uh, department in the video here. So, you know, uh, please like and, and support certainly the Monrovia department and, and Blake and their efforts. But, you know, if you're here in the county, and again, we said 85% of citizens in the U.S. are served by volunteer fire departments, and most of these are gonna have a Facebook or, or a website. And, it, and, and the other thing I'd say is if you're a business owner, it's someone like me who uh, happens to own a business to, to be supportive of your employees who may be uh, volunteer firefighters and, and, and to, to allow them the, the flexibility to serve and do to help members of their community because it's making everything a better place for everybody around you. So I certainly wanna encourage other business owners out there that have that ability to have their employees who may be that. And certainly, you know, we're here working for a cause at wherever you work, but but certainly be supportive of that because it makes our community a better and stronger and better place to live. Uh, Blake, thanks so much for, for all you and, and all uh, the folks at, at your department and all the volunteer fire departments in, 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 in around the U.S. and certainly here in Madison County. One, thank the folks if they're watching anybody from East Lansom that serve, serve where my family lives too. But again, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate sure. it. And um, we look forward to, to you know supporting you guys in the future and uh, take care and be safe out there. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for everyone's support. Thank you.